Sometimes we are enthralled by the beauty of another culture, but what happens when our appreciation becomes an obsession? Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to This House. Today we are exploring Wakehurst in Newport. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. James John Van Allen seemed like the perfect match for Emily Astor. He had grown up in an old money family, had attended Harvard and Oxford, and could enjoy his life as he pleased, receiving money from trust and investments which had been set up for him in generations prior. But Emily's father, William Backhouse Astor Jr., could not stand the presence of his daughter's suitor. Though James had come from a respectable family, the elite circles of New York had made fun of him. James wore a monocle, though he did not require one. He was also known for quoting Shakespeare in just about every conversation and using English expressions in place of American ones. Emily Astor seemed to be about the only person who liked the Renaissance man. When James asked William for his daughter's hand in marriage, William scolded him. His words offended James to such a degree that James immediately challenged him to a duel for Emily's hand. They arranged for the time and place, including all formalities, before William backed out. With William conceding, James and Emily married and spent five wonderful years together until Emily passed away during childbirth. James was distraught with grief and returned home to his father, General Van Allen, who gifted James a parcel of land at his estate known as the Grange. Shortly after, his father passed away and James began building his dream house. First, he had his father's house demolished so he could build a massive garage in its place. Then he set out to replicate a castle he had seen while in England. He hired Charles Kemp to create a set of drawings replicating the Wake place in Sussex, so he could build an exact copy in Newport, Rhode Island. With very subtle differences, the mansion ended up being nearly identical, but made from Indiana limestone with a Vermont slate roof and nestled in a lush garden. Before we go inside, I'll point out that while the layout is the same as the original house, the rooms are not. James searched for rooms in Europe to have dismantled and shipped to his new mansion to make it appear older. This led to him coining the phrase, museum rooms, which were to be enjoyed only by the eyes. Entering the home, you would arrive in the long gallery, which stretched to each wing of the house. It was furnished with English antiques, some dating back to the 16th century, and finished out with wood-paneled walls and leaded windows, all set below a Jacobian ceiling. In the center of the hall, facing the front door, was a replicated staircase which had been assembled in England along with its antiques before being broken down and shipped to Newport to be reassembled. It featured a massive stained glass window centered on its landing flanked by portraits. Tapestries decorated the other walls below a Jacobian ceiling which contrasted with the dark wood newel post, paired with intricately carved balustrade. Heading left in the long gallery, you would arrive in the Belgian dining room. This room, in its entirety, had been dismantled from a Renaissance-era house in Belgium and reassembled here. The walls had been finished out with 16th century Spanish leather panels, which had been painstakingly restored when they were disassembled. The end result was a 400-year-old room in a brand new mansion. Continuing towards the front of the house from the dining room, you would arrive in the library. It had originally been designed by famed neoclassical architect Robert Adam for a 1780s townhouse in London. The broken pediment of the fireplace's upper mantle rested against a laurel motif set in the frieze above painted wood panels. In the center of the room was a large crystal chandelier. James had decided not to run electricity in the house in favor of gas-burning lamps to enhance the period ambiance. Set against the window was one of his prized possessions, a sofa which had been said to have belonged to Napoleon, though it is possible that it had actually belonged to Napoleon's brother brother who built a home in New Jersey known as Point Breeze. Walking back into the long gallery, we will now cut across the house to the other wing where we will enter the drawing room which was sometimes used as a ballroom. This room was as large as the dining room and library combined, with a chandelier containing 136 candles which had to be lit using matches. Though James did not have a formal art gallery, he used the ballroom to display the portraits of his ancestors and the spaces between pilasters. In the center of one wall was a floor-to-ceiling limestone fireplace. Its mantle supported by Corinthian-style pedestals, and its upper mantle complete with stone relief work. Tucked between the ballroom and the staircase was a more modestly sized smoking room, which had been salvaged from the home of the former mistress of the Prince of Wales. This was said to have been James's favorite room, where he would spend time reading and having intimate conversations with close friends. Going upstairs, the oak bedroom was equally as grand, with antique furniture set above elaborate carpets. The ceilings were painted white, with ornate plasterwork depicting vines. The Mrs. Van Allen room was finished out with board and batten wood paneling below a coffered ceiling, with cream-colored 
textiles upholstering the furnishings. A large wooden mantel was covered with intricate carvings around the stone hearth. Other features of the bedroom included built-in bookcases and leaded diamond-paned windows, creating a charming atmosphere. Upon one occasion, James hosted the granddaughter of Queen Victoria, Princess Helena, who delighted in exploring the house. She found many antiques and items which she recognized from her childhood. It was said that this was a thrilling experience for her as she shared memories from her royal upbringing. James enjoyed hosting parties and living in Wakehurst up until the days of Prohibition. He had no plans to quit drinking and decided to move to England where he leased Rushton Hall. He lived here for the rest of his short years until passing in 1923. He left his fortune, along with Wakehurst, to his only son, Jimmy, though he passed away just four years later, leaving the remainder of the wealth and estate to his widow Margaret Louise Post, also known as Daisy. She sold their city mansions and moved to Wakehurst permanently, where she was pampered by a permanent staff of 37 people. She was known as the last great Gilded Age hostess as she continued formalities into the 1950s. While entertaining, her guests would have access to private chauffeurs and would receive a full hunt breakfast to start their days, complete with a 36-piece gold table set. Daisy passed away in 1969, leaving her estate to her three children to divide evenly, though two of her children declined their inheritance. Her son William accepted the estate and began selling the antiques and art collection along with most of the land the house sat on. By 1972, he had finished liquidating everything aside from the house. He approached Sal Regina University, offering to sell it to them for $200,000, which they gladly accepted. Today, the mansion continues to serve the university and can be enjoyed by students on campus. There are several more photos of this house on the Library of Congress website. You can find the link to the photo gallery in the pinned comment and in the video's description. Which room was your favorite? Let me know down below in the comments section. And while you're there, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. I would also like to take a moment to say a special thank you to our This House supporters whose names you can see on screen right now. If you would like to see your name on the screen, please consider joining our membership program today. I'll see you next time on This House.